Hi, book club members. I'm Jen Bosher. And I'm Carrie Honey. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 30, discussing Lucas the Trickster by Josh Reynolds. The book is about the most infamous space wolf member, Lucas the Trickster. Imagine that. And his misadventures and exploits when a group of dark Eldar decide to invade Fenris. Ruh-roh. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, the site, or Encrypted Vox channel, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts and or vidcasts. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read Lucas the Trickster, go back, to, go back, check out the book, and then come back to this post, as we're going to be discussing it from start to finish in great detail. Also... I'd like to point out that we have had so many technical difficulties recording this podcast tonight. Um, Carrie and I both need new computers. <laughs> I think we're just going to throw that out there. And it's really just me because this rig is like seven years old now. So let's go. Well, so I need a new computer as well. Jen needs a new webcam. And a new computer. I built this rig seven years ago and I have not been lighting the requisite incense for it. So we are beyond no, tech was- priests. We are beyond. I was trying to think how old mine is, and I'm pretty sure it's somewhere between 2013 and 2014 is when I've had this. So it's time. I want to say, I want to say that I was building this PC right around the time. I think we got them like right around the same time. That would make because sense. Because I vaguely remember us discussing this. You know, so. you're you're right. Um, yeah, because I had to have it for work. The like, true story. I really did have mm-hmm. to have a better. Gaming computer, seriously, I did, for work. And um, I think Jim just, well, y'all needed one to begin with, and then Jim just wanted something so he could play his Total Warhammer on. We were running on an even older, back in that time, we were running on a computer that was already like seven years old. And so, yeah, he had to- he had um, Shogun Total War 2, oh like on the bare minimum graphics. So when he we built the new rig my husband was like zooming in and he's like you can see their faces <laughs> it was like the future <laughs> you guys the future uh so <laughs> anyways all of that aside it's like it was like we're back in uh, 1997 seeing the trailers for final fantasy 7 <gasps> the graphics will never be better than this still for me it's still resident evil code veronica she falls and she catches the gun <laughs> Everybody who came to our house were like, want to have your mind blown? <laughs> and everybody would sit on the couch going, oh. yeah, Code Veronica was awesome. Anyways, so, um, the, yes, I, I'm very, I feel very much like a tech priest right now, which I don't think Lucas the Trickster would approve of. So, like, I try to step back in there. Anyways. I don't know. He was kind of friends with their Iron Wolf. He was. And I actually really liked that character. So, I did, too. <laughs> Did you like this book overall? I love this book. I'm glad. It may, yes, I know. This is going to be kind of a opposite of Spear of the Emperor for us. So I love this book. I was laughing from beginning to end. I knew Jim was not going to like it. Um, how to put this? Um, didn't. I didn't actually. I really went into this bright-eyed and bushy-tailed because I have faith in Josh Reynolds. I just, so I think the reason why you're able to like Fabius Bile over Lucas the Trickster is because Josh Reynolds was able to make Fabius humorous, whereas otherwise he's just a deplorable character. And I think Lucas is too silly for you. Lucas is much too silly for me. That's actually, that hits the nail pretty much on the head for me. Um, I actually the mo the times that I laughed the most actually involved Lady Malice, which I never saw because her phrasing was delicious. Like I think one of my favorite things she said um, was when she talks about like, well, what's a party without a few fatalities? And I was like, that's a good question. But my favorite one, which I have referenced on here, is he is amoral, despicable, and impeccably dressed. Dude, I- okay, so when the and the Dark Eldar would get together and chit-chat, especially with Malice around. It was like a Dark Eldar version of Downton Abbey. Pretty much. Oh, it very much was. Um, it reminded me of... Uh, oh, shoot. What's that movie? 
Oh, it'll come to me in a minute. But it, yes, it was very much just this murderous... You know what, do you know what it reminded me of? Okay, so when you think of rites of passage, do you remember how like there's all this catty, coy, like, oh, we're working against these people, but we're going to pretend to be nice. They just took rid of... They got rid of all of that. And they're just on the surface that we're trying to kill you, just so we're clear. And oh, you old so-and-so trying to kill me again. I, I, I mean, I have to admit that really like the beginning of the party and there's already an assassination attempt on Sliska's and he's like, oh, we're going to get this out of the way early. Awesome. <laughs> just like, just another day. I at first, at first I was like, uh, we're going to have a point of view character from a Slis from a dark Eldar. Uh, and then by the end of the book, I was like, well, this is my favorite character in the book. <laughs> just because. Like when at the end of the book, another one of my favorite scenes with Sliskus is at the end of the book when he's walking out on that platform and he literally strikes a pose. Yes. <laughs> what the hell? I liked it. I approved. Um, See, I was laughing early on I... the, from the very beginning. The space wolves are having to duke it out for who gets Lucas for the year. I just, that just found so comical to me that they would draw straws and the two people that had the same length had to fight until one yielded and lucas is just like this is just how it is i'm just hanging out here with the real wolves and you know whatever while they're all fighting and probably what did it to me was gosh when how red maw ended up winning was that he lifted up the bench that all the space wolves were sitting on <laughs> i'm just imagining this and clocks Grimblood with it. I mean... That was pretty good, yes. Like, oh my god. Like, that just that just killed me. And they're like, oh, fine, I get this guy. <laughs> just, they don't even, like, mask <laughs> how they feel. You know, and... No. You know, and... No, they definitely don't. And he just goes back uh, with, um, with the... Uh, rune priest who's just like you know you really don't have to be this way and he's like yeah i do they kind of expect it by now it's like this is just pretty much how he's gonna play things that and then yeah right away he goes back to where the red claws are hanging out of his new pack and he's like mm -hmm. who's in charge and the guy's like well i am he's like no wrong i am so then they all attack him and he beats the shit out of all of them and was like okay so again yes. where's my drink <laughs> it's like all right, this is awesome. <laughs> I, yeah, that none of that stuff really connected with me as I was reading it. I was just like, mm, mm. um, I and I can't, I can't really put a finger on it. It might be because it's silly. Um, so I was, so I think I said during the quarantine part of our, we've gone back to the Great Depression. Um, I've actually been reading books aloud to my husband while he plays Total Warhammer because, you know, <laughs> we don't have enough Warhammer in our lives. Um, and even he was kind of like, uh, I was like, eh. but we did both agree that Sliskus was delightful. Uh, See, now that's, <laughs> there was some that's, lines. that's interesting to me that he would even agree that a dark El Eldar was, was delightful. And the thing about Jim is that he takes his Warhammer very seriously. I mean, extremely serious. So Lucas the Trickster would not fit in his stereotype. And I think that's why he resonates with me so well. Because he's not like everybody else. He's not like the other space wolves. You know, he understands what it's like to have a sense of humor. Whereas the rest of them just don't most of the time. And he takes mm -hmm. that, you know, I think if some of the, if he ever found a pack leader that had a sense of humor, he may not play so many, as many pranks as the extreme. Because once he figures out, he's like, you know, the, the youngest child, once he figures out what gets your goat, he will not stop. And it's basically, it's, it's to get a reaction. He's like, if you're going to throw a shit fit over me doing this little prank, what's going to happen if I up the ante? You know, and it's one of those that no one, for whatever reason, ever figured out. You just slide into his skid. You know, the Red Claws right. all figure it out. They figure it out quickly. Mm -hmm. And then they all, all like right. him. And 
I guess to me, like the best thing about him is seeing like these other layers of him in this because it's something I always kind of thought he was like that he has this facade and he's really a great Red Claw teacher. Right, for the Blood Claws. And he, um, so let's talk about the little blood bit. Claw, what did Red you Claw. Think you know what? They all have weird you. names. <laughs> they do. Actually, as you were saying that, I was like, D I think you mean Red Maw. And then I was like, oh, wait, Blood Claw. Do you know what they're? red like well yes red mob was anyway. a pack leader the blood claws are like the new recruits in a pack yep so let's talk a little bit about that because that is one thing that even though i didn't like lucas as a character and i didn't really like the book that much i was very fascinated and impressed by how well and i, I shouldn't have been that impressed because it's josh reynolds and he always has a knack for doing this how much he expanded upon that character and he really fleshed him out and he's not just this trickster one-dimensional her, her, I do jokes like he has feelings and he has emotions and he has a strong drives and so and he's let's smart start with he's very yeah. smart <laughs> he's a strategic yes, genius he's very cunning he is he just it's really funny because as you're reading some of this, I all I could wonder the whole time is I was like, dude, like if you actually focused and applied yourself, like you would be a tactical genius. He would probably go down as one of the better uh, pack leaders and one of the better Jarls because. Well, but I think that's why he doesn't. Because he kind of yes, likes. He's a true think, contrarian. But I think also what, what the thing is, is that he kind of wants to show everybody that you can have a sense of humor and still be brilliant mm -hmm. and it be and have this, you know, brilliant, you know, strategic mind. And no one's willing to do that because he doesn't follow the rules. Well, you know who else didn't follow the rules? Lehman Russ did not follow the rules. So I just found that parallel. No. Yeah. I found that parallel right, right there. I was like, and he's more no. like his sire than most of these others are because they all see him as some, you know, God who was perfect. No, he's the guy who fucking laughed when Lion was kicking his ass. I mean, yes, that's because who... he could recognize the absurdity of the situation. So like, right. he took things very seriously. But and I think he actually represents that side of I think Lucas very much channels that side of Lehman Russ took things seriously. Mm hmm. But he knew when to take a step back and be like, what are we doing? Right. So I did like that. What surprised you about Lucas's character? Oh, let's see. Um, I don't know, because I'm trying to think of this, like from Ashes of Prospero, we already kind of got this idea from him that he was looking out for the blood claws, that he was teaching them right. things. Um. I guess mm -hmm. one thing I suppose that maybe surprised me about him is like I knew he was always a prankster, but the stuff that he would do to drive the point home to the blood claws of this is how tradition is and this is why it sucks. For example, mm -hmm. when they were going after the Kraken, it was their right. kill, they got it, and then sure enough, Grimblood shows up and they're all like, but wait, and look, and on Loki because he, he's space Loki let's face it he's space Loki let's um, be honest yeah so then Lucas steps back and he's just like no guys this is how it is you go do the work he takes the glory and they're all like that's not right and they go in charge he doesn't lead the charge they go and charge them and right. they get backhanded and everything and he's just like I'm just showing you how it is just so you know how much it sucks and how stupid it is and I have to say I'm like dude I'm right there with you. That was some fucking bullshit. That Grimblood just be like, eh, that's mine. It was. It was very much an alpha dog thing to do, right? Um, it's for foreshadowing for the end as well. Lucas has Sliskis on the yeah. run. Grimblood's like, yes, he knows where he is. Now I'm coming in for the glory. It's like, dude. Right. You haven't learned anything, very have much you? So. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so along those lines, one of the things that, so one of the things I really didn't like about Lucas was that when he waxed sentimental, he was clearly, clearly an author stand in for Josh Reynolds. Like there were a few times, and I understand that, yes, all characters really are, but there are some times when authors really just through a character's mouth and are basically talking 
to you as an audience. But so on one hand, I didn't like that, but I really liked one of his observations in that moment where he said, when he was talking about, look at how our people live. Mm -hmm. This is pride. And when he talked about Ultramar and he's like, look, the warriors of the people of Ultramar live in peace and prosperity and the Ultramarines build every bit as tough of warriors as we do. And I was like, just to read that on paper, I was like, oh, that's a really good point, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, like the white scars, you get the impression that they're very tribal too. Chagoras is, but um, not quite to the extent that Fenris is. And if you ever read, I'm so sorry if you did, but if you ever read the William King book, um, that first book, they really detail how brutal life is for the tribes of Fenris. And I, that always really resonated with me. And I always, I've never really liked that about the space wolves. And so I really liked when Josh Reynolds as Lucas, uh, pointed that out that look, the Ultramarines are a bit as tough as we are and they don't do this to their people. Right. Well, and also, you know, I guess, you know, what really, my, if anything surprised me, it was how much he loves the people of Fenris. And like, you know, even when, you know, Ake was just like, why are you feeding them? Why are you helping the weak? And he's like, because they're our people and we take care of our own. And and it's just yes. one of those things that, you know, we see all the time, you know, especially with the Ultramarines where we have like Marnius Calgar and Reboot Gulliman telling, you know, the others, like, for example, are salty like Primaris from um, Knights of McCrag. Yes, you're better than them. And physically, but you're not better than them. And your job is to take care of them. It's just this constant lesson. You are and that's tasked. Right. And Lucas is that lesson for these blood claws and any other blood claws he ends up taking. You know, next year, who knows who he'll be, be with. <laughs> right. For sure. And um, yes, I did find that very interesting because that's always this dichotomy. I think... It surprised me coming from Lucas and that really he reminded me of like, I don't know, Batman's not the right term, but he reminded me of like this vigilante, almost like this protectorate yeah, for yeah. his people, his, his people as in the people of Fenris and that, whereas everybody else is going off and, oh, let's go fight orcs and let's go fight Dark Eldar. He has not lost sight of the fact that, no, we need to take care of our home world. And I really liked that a lot about him. And that actually took me aback in terms of characterization for him. Because again, I just didn't expect that. I didn't expect that emotional Mm -hmm. maturity and depth. So, you know, probably when I uh, underestimated him, I underestimated him just like everybody else. That's a side effect of Lucas. You know, and I wrote down this one quote of the rune priest talking to um, Grimblood. Mm-hmm. And he's call- he's, he was describing describing Lucas to him. He's like, he's the fool in the court of Russ, speaking truth where it is neither wanted nor acceptable. And that's one thing I liked I about Lucas. Like that. that he did just, where they're just willing to gloss it over and not talk about how unfair maybe a tradition is or maybe how this is outgrown, blah, blah, blah. He's just no problem pointing it out. No problem pointing out other people's flaws. I mean, they point out his all the time. You know, why not point oh, out theirs? Yeah, for sure. And then Grimblood says, then why let him do so? Because it must be done. There must be one voice at least that howls against tradition, else we grow complacent. I really liked that scene. I liked that. So let's actually talk. Let's transition and talk a little bit about that because this was, there was a lot of interestingness in this. One of the things I've never liked about Lucas is that I've always been of the mind of why, why tolerate him? I mean, as you saw the space wolves, not, I don't think any of the chapters, and this is another thing that I have to credit to William King. He really detailed this in his first space wolves book too. The space wolves, Really don't give a shit if their aspirants die. I don't necessarily think that any of the chapters are overly concerned with it, but the space wolves are like they're even less concerned with whether or not their aspirants died. So the fact that they tolerate Lucas and haven't just given him the old yeller treatment because his dog, get it? Anyways. Yes, um, I, I, I got it. It's been one of those nights. Um, 
the fact that they tolerated him was always very strange to me. So a lot of page space and a lot of philosophy is given over to why they tolerate Lucas. So first off, what does that say about the Space Wolves as a chapter? Uh, I don't... I'm not really sure. Uh, it's like, like, what it says about them as a chapter? Why they tolerate him or why they don't care about their aspirants? Why they don't No, I think why they tolerate him. Because Gale Runner, as you said, right. Gale Runner Thank you, that's gives a lot of page space. Yeah, Gale Runner gives a lot of page space to yeah. why we stomach this guy and why we put up with him. I found it interesting that the Space Wolves who are very much in tradition and very much into right and uh, right, R-I-T-E, and just that rote memorization of all of their stories and their sagas, and this is the way of things that they need a, a fire brand that he says, like, it is critical that we have this fire brand amongst us. Well, that's um, interesting to me. So when I started reading... Ragnar Blackmane. Mm -hmm. He mentions Lucas a little bit and how he sees a little bit of worth in him. And I think, mm -hmm. honestly, his worth is the fact of what Gale Runner said. He speaks the truth. He's that one voice out there that's not going to let us be complacent or content. It's going to be that one little thorn always asking questions. Mm -hmm. But man, you need to come up with a quick attack. This guy, and the thing is, no one's going to recognize his strategic genius, except, the, except for the blood claws that were under him. And even when they get promoted to Grey Hunter, which as Grimblood said, a lot of those blood claws will, which is kind of all to Lucas, him raising them that way. Very much. And they, they most likely, unfortunately, will, most of them will lose some of Lucas's lessons and they'll just kind of keep a tradition and then they'll forget about him and they won't want him in their packs. Right. Which is, they'll, go ahead. I was like, I was just say, it's, it's just, it's just the ways, way things like even Lucas or Gale Runner says it, he's like, you know, a few will stay with him, will stay loyal to him. But like I don't like like um, Kadir, who just worshipped everything Lucas said, understood everything Lucas had to say, and was totally on his side of everything. You know he's gonna be he he you know he's gonna be the ones promoted to Grey Hunter, and he's going to go on and forget all about Lucas. Yes, I actually thought the same thing about Kadir. I loved him as a character. I thought he was really great. Um, but I had that same thought. And I find that also very interesting that they, this idea that we need to have a firebrand. And not only do we need to have a firebrand, we really need to have this firebrand helping and teaching these pups, as they call them. Um, we need to have them teach him teaching these lessons. It's interesting to me that they recognize the value in this and that they have these blood claws who were like, oh, yeah, you know, I think Lucas has these great ideas, but not many of them seem to really because keep in mind he's several hundred years old so you would think that there would be more more people within the pack so it would be like no 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 lucas is pretty cool lucas has got good ideas yeah he he is pretty cool but here's the other thing about lucas that he kind of acknowledges but not really he's not a good follower he's a great leader he's a fantastic leader but you got to follow. Yes, which is also surprising. <laughs> which you have to follow before you can lead. So even if, like, I would probably say out of that pack of the survivors, well, if Dag had survived, he would have. But I think Dag and Halvar both would have stayed loyal to Lucas. But the problem is that they tried to elevate him to Grey Hunter and put him under their command. It never would have worked because Lucas doesn't listen to others. And that's probably, not probably, that is his biggest flaw. Because I think if, so. if Russ came back, Lucas would still be an ass to him. Oh, absolutely. And I think he Russ would laugh you. about it. He'd God, laugh about it, but then forth. be like, yep, that's why you're staying where you are. You're funny. I, yeah, I think that would basically be his reaction as well. That he would be like, huh, funny. So you're just staying where exactly where you are. 
Um, but you know what? I think, I think Lucas, he's content. I think Lucas likes being where he is. He likes teaching the blood claws, letting him kind of graduate as he moves on to the next pack who doesn't want him and keeps going. I think, I think he's like one of those people who, so, and I think we all knew or even know a person like this who, especially when you were younger, would flit from relationship to relationship because they were addicted to the getting to know you and falling in love piece. But the actual relationship piece was not so great for them right and like you see that with people flip from hobby to hobby where like the learning and the ramp up of the hobby is so much fun but then once you really get into it then you're like Meh, it's kind of boring now like lucas reminded me of that especially with the blood claws of this idea of okay i've got new people who don't know my bag of tricks i'm gonna teach them a few things and then they're gonna go off and then i'll find a new group of people to try my shtick out on them yeah and um i guess what i'm saying is i think he has a fear of commitment that's valid. I mean, which must be very unfortunate for a space marine. Which, well, I think it's odd for a wolf. You know, he's a guy who it's not craving a pack. No, not at all. He is not at all craving that pack, which, uh, yeah, that does make him a little more like a coyote or wait for it. A jackal. Jackal. I was like, you know, he's he's happy uh, he's happy oh. raising the pups, and then when the pups are ready to get off the teat, he's just like, and see you later. And who's next? He's the mama bird kicking his bird his baby out of the tree. <laughs> You're ready to fly now, right? <laughs> Hi, Felicia. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's very much, and I think there was some in that. I like that idea that they're like, no, we need this person who calls us into challenge and kind of keeps us in check and puts us in our place but i like the wisdom there but the fact that as soon as you're outside of his pack i mean maybe it's like a life cycle thing like you're out of the pack and then eventually you get to the point that gail runner's at where he's like i've been doing this for like 800 years trust me lucas is worthwhile like maybe it's like a circle of life thing oh i don't think anyone's going to go up against a rune priest especially one favored by the black mane yeah Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. <laughs> Gale Runner, uh Gale Runner was very direct. I liked Gale Runner a, a lot. lot. I liked I him too. a lot. Actually. Especially he when just he just would... reminded me of like this Oh sorry. I was say, but especially when you try to counsel uh, uh Lucas and he would hit a nerve. You know, because he, you know, he, no one likes the truth, especially Lucas. He doesn't mind the truth. He doesn't like the truth about him. <laughs> oh, no. You know, it's like, you know, when he thinks he's dying, he's like, what's his last words? He thinks, damn it, Grimblood is right. I don't like this. He, yeah. You know, can't let somebody else have that last laugh, that last word in. So he's not going to let anybody, even someone who's known him as long as Gale Runner has, point out his flaws or... I mean, not his flaws, but the truth of what he's actually doing. Because he's just right. going to, you know, dig his heels in the ground. Like, nah, uh mm-hmm. You know, really, instead of, I'd a, agree with that. instead of a wolf or even a jackal, he's almost like a chow chow. You know, and I used to have a chow chow. And I loved this fluffy dog, man the best dog ever but the thing about the chow is that they really don't fully understand their origin aside from china there's this myth that they were mixed with bears or wolves or lions either way they were war dogs that actually did hunt wolves in china and of course when they were done with them they ate them that's where they got the name chow chow no mystery there but the chow is not a pack dog Chow is alone and likes one person and stays with that one person the rest of its life. So imagine how cruel that is. And it's like, what? what's wrong, daddy? Why are you killing me? But that's just, but that's how Chow rolls. Right. And, um, and that's kind of Lucas in a lot of ways that he, you know, he's got this mixture mm-hmm. of that cat and dog in him that he's just, right. he's going to play on his own rules. You pet him when he wants to be pet which is just like what a chow does. 
you know, when he's done, he's defensive, you kind of back off. There's a lot of similarities. And of course, you know, of course, he's a redheaded stepchild. I mean, what other color hair are you going to give him? Stepchild. Well, we've always said that, you know, that, Literally. that Warhammer 40k is the subtlety of a 2 by 4 so. Pretty much. Don't believe me? Go look Pretty at much. Korax's last words. Okay. First off, the fact that his name is Raven Raven. Details, details. Because his name is Corvus, Corvus Corax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, actually, so this randomly, I forgot to mention one of the parts that really did stand out to me. And this is one of the things I loved. Basically, anytime he was talking with Timer, uh, <laughs> like when he talked to when they find the uh, stasis bomb. <laughs> and... And he says, uh, the last I heard, the lion's sons were the only one who knew how to build these things. And the dark angels are not the sort to share their secrets, especially with us. <laughs> and then I suddenly was thinking about, like, War of Secrets. And I was like, I would like all of those bastards to meet Lucas. That um, would be fun. Talk about a guy who'd be laughing while fighting with them. Because they still have the honor duel, right? Like, I think that would be just amazing. Just so we're clear. Uh, well, I don't know that the Dark I don't know if they still well. do. After... Mm, after Grimnar, Black Mane. S something happens in the so very after beginning of that book. <laughs> yeah, so I think... Something bad. I... Yeah, so I think before the space will, the Dark Angels show up to try to kill all the wolfen, I think maybe they probably still did it, but now it's probably a little bit of a delicate subject. Anyways. <laughs> so, yeah. speaking, so we have Lucas on one hand. We have this eschewing tradition, does what he wants, laissez-faire, Lucas, and we, counter, we counterbalance that with Duke Trevelyoth Sliscus, who he was very much the perfect foil is he a foil or is he just lucas in sheep's clothing i mean come on evil lucas yes yes pretty much i mean i think so so the, just you know the only difference is is that <laughs> lucas wouldn't think of just raiding a random planet and killing people for fun but again He's basically Lucas with a mustache because how many times the split does screen. Lucas? Right, exactly. <laughs> how many times does Lucas just play a prank on somebody? Like he locked an Inquisitor in a Grox pen. That's hilarious to me, by the way. That, that's actually quite funny. Um, but that Inquisitor could have died. Like he, how many times and? does he risk people's lives <laughs> for the lulls? Like how much stuff does he do for the lulls? So, really, when Sliskis was like, oh, yeah, we're going to go raid Fenris, cuz, I was like, oh, yeah, you're just evil Lucas. Like, Lucas would never just go and massacre or harm people for the jo the for the for um, kicks, but he does other stuff for it. So, it's like, it's like Sliskis is just this dark mirror version of Lucas. Would it really be so bad and the Inquisitor was killed in the Grox pit? I mean, I guess it could be, since, you know, we now know that the Inquisitors have threatened to wipe out this chapter before. Relations might be a little delicate. I do I do like the idea that he meets one and he's like, I got an idea. But then he talks <laughs> about learning stuff about the Eldar from her, too, so. Um, but anyway. They might have been great friends yeah, until like, he threw her into the Grox pit. <laughs> that's entirely possible, too. Um, but so what it was interesting to me to see this dichotomy and again it's not very subtle but to see this back and forth of I don't answer to anybody I really don't I don't really value Lucas values the life of his blood claws but he's also not totally opposed to putting them in grave danger either and Whereas, again, Sliskus is doing that for his amusement. Lucas is more like, hey, you gotta learn sometime, right? Which, well, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I how, felt as though how otters teach their pups how to swim? Pretty much, right? Like, a lot of animals do that, right? What it reminded me of a lot was I picked up a lot of Dragon Age vibes. So, Sliskus, he pretty much would 
risk people's lives because they weren't playing the game very well. So he's saying he's like for Orle. Actually, I could see that about all the Dark Eldar. Like Cormora is just Orle. Yeah. And without the masks. Oh, yeah. But yeah. yet with the masks. Yeah. Because but... Harlequins. Well, that's a whole other thing because they're not actually aligned with Kimura. They're, uh, we'll talk about more about them in a second. They're complicated. Um, but the idea that whenever they mentioned Kimorites, I was like, or lesions. But again, this idea of like Lucas is more like, I'm trying to teach you a lesson. And like, okay, you just got grabbed down by a Kraken. All right, I'll rescue you. But you didn't learn the lesson very well. <laughs> Whereas Sliskis is more of, you're just not playing the game very well. Right. Again, again with the assassination attempt when he's like, oh, are we getting this out of the way already? What? Wasn't so there a line in Dragon Age Inquisition about a party with assassination attempts? Something. Uh-huh. Yeah. I can't remember if it's Madame Lafer or if it's uh, what's her face? The girl that neither of us like. Um, That's not narrowing it down. Oh, the, the left um, hand of the Inquisition. The uh, Cassandra elf? and no Cassandra. Oh, and... um, Liliana. I let Liliana. I is that her name? Redhead. Yeah. I let. I yeah. I let her die in the first game, so I was very disappointed when she came back. Um. So. <laughs> Canon Anyways, problems. Uh, yeah, your choices really matter, problems. right? Right, EA? <laughs> Cookie cutters. Uh, anyways, so one of the things that I found very interesting, I mean, that was, uh, to finish that thought, that was the joke that she made when she talks about, she's like, there were four assassination attempts. It's a lovely party. <laughs> um, so one of the things I found very interesting, though, was that so we know that Lucas is kind of being protected by Gill Runner and by extension, probably the Grey Wolf a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this he's being protected. And, OK, we kind of understand this and you got to just kind of suffer him. How did you feel about the revelation that Sliskis is Vec is kind of. He's not really hunting him and he's not really angering him because he realizes that Sliska serves a purpose. Uh, it's just more Dark Eldar shit. I mean, again, this is just another sect of rich people. Bored rich people is what this is. Bored, but maybe not rich honest, people. But bored, honest, bored uh, nobility. Bored immortal nobility. Right, right. And that's, I think... They deal with that in some books and games where you deal with people. Actually, the Elder Scrolls series is really big at the, about this, um, especially in Morrowind. They, when they talk about if you've played the Elder Scroll books, you know about Lady Berenzia. Um, they talk about because the elves live for several hundred years that oh, everybody goes through a promiscuous phase. Everybody goes through a murderous phase, right? Because, <laughs> sure. you know, I guess you get bored. After a hundred years of being exactly. good. Right. Right. Exactly. Actually, one of the things that makes me think about is in Mass Effect, when you're talking to, I can't remember which game it is. I think it's the second one. When you're talking to one of the Astari and she's in love with the the Krogan. Oh, and yes. She's yes. Like, oh, that that yeah, random and side quest. Like, and she's like, I just don't know, because Krogan lived for like 200 or 300 years. She's like, it's not like a human. You're with them for like 50 years and they die. Like, this is like a real commitment. Always... Exactly. This uh, Krogan's going to be a real commitment here. And, um, but, you know, you want happy Krogan. Anyways. Um, he, he was singing I... love poetry to her. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't say no to that. You get a Krogan singing love poetry. <laughs> yeah. Which, by the way, can we just talk for one second about how weird the Slith were? They just, why would you? All right. Well, you know, I say that about a lot of Dark Eldar things. And I say that about a lot of, um, what's his nut, Fabius Bile things. This is just another one of their weird ass things. Mm -hmm. Like the Mandrakes. Yeah. Another one of their weird ass things. Okay. Oh my gosh. So the next question was, how do we feel about the Dark Eldar in general? So talk about the Mandrakes for a second. Um. 
The Dark Eldar no. are just Emperor's children in elves' clothing. Next. <laughs> so, the mandrakes actually surprised me a little bit. Um, <laughs> they surprised a lot of people, I think we could argue. Hmm. Rest in peace, Dag. Um, too they... soon, man. Too soon. I'm sorry, I was actually a little sad by Dag's death. I was like, oh, of course she killed my favorite. Um, I love Dag. Because Dag... I loved Dag. How did you not love Dag? I sh I was not sad to see Ake die when he died. I was kind of like, oh. Yeah, he's kind of an asshole. But I understand yeah. why everyone yeah. else was sad. Because yes. Lucas did have a point. He was the fire belly. And I guess my big problem with Ake was just when the couple times you got his point of view, and he was just like... <laughs> Why does everyone follow Kadir? Don't they understand that I'm the best guy to follow? I'm like, well, that's why no one follows you. Right? Because right? Kadir doesn't think yes. these things to my to himself. I'm the perfect leader. He just does. Right. He just does. He just does the thing. And he And has I wasn't surprised Ake was going to die because he would he, again, kinda like Lucas, he was not taking orders. And he knew better than everybody else. Not only that, but he was Correct. just increasingly bitter about them being cast out because of Lucas. Whereas everybody else was just, nah, it's just the way it is. And Ake was just throwing his temper tantrum the entire time. I was like, yeah, you're not, you're not surviving this. I don't know what's going to happen, but you're not surviving this. Because in a way, by his death. in a way, you bitching the entire time about being cast out and not being in this warm castle makes you weak. Yes, very much so. But, so I think the reason that the Mandrakes surprise So, actually, it's not really the Mandrakes so much as... So you have Murda, uh, the, the... Oh my god, the late... Lamian? Yeah, the Lamian. Um, who... You have her, and you have Malice, who... I could not keep up with their their scheming. At all. Well, I actually could keep up with Mur Murda's, but Malice's... Murda like, was pretty when simple. She turned in, yeah, but when Malice turned in Jinkar, I was like... Why though? You know, Malice, I think, well, Malice was only on one side, really, and that was her own. And, Very much so. But she was pulling all these contingency strings, and then they didn't, she had too many of them, so they weren't really panning out. Right. But I guess I liked the idea that they were all scheming and they were all going toward this their own goals and they're playing it was this the very game backstabbing they were playing the game, playing the game. but i couldn't i couldn't quite figure out what her game was what her end game was well we never got to because find out why hurt. she why she wanted his help why she wanted sliska's help we never right we never do i mean he assumed it was because vect threw her out of his favor and we don't know the truth on that either because there's rumors that mm -hmm. no, he threw her out and she's like, no, I left him. But is that a woman scorn talking or is that, or is that the truth? And just, you know, Vec tested has a reputation to keep. And so, of course, he keeps his, his stuff out in line. We'll never know. We will honestly never know because she mm -hmm. kind of had a terminal case of bomb on the back. Right. Well, he doesn't turn around to see, because remember, she pulls it off of her self, and then he detonates it, and it says he didn't turn around to see if it hit the target or not. So... Hmm. Murda and but, her fate are kind of left up to question mark, question mark, question but they mark. Weren't, but they were not on his ship. They that, did not we leave with him. Now. So, well, he said that he no. couldn't sense her anywhere. Right. Um... Maybe they hitched a ride on something else. Maybe, I don't know. Because remember, at one point, they do say, uh, she does tell Murda, she's like, you could just get into a webway and just go. And remember, Murda's like, where would I go, though? Right. Doesn't mean it's impossible, though. And I found... I don't know. But, you know, I think that's something else we're never going to know. Because we're not going to have a sequel to this. So... No, we're not. And this was unless very... somebody else picks up Lucas the trickster, and even then, who's to say if they'll pick up this story, or even acknowledge this story? So, right. And 
So let me ask you that. Let's bounce ahead really quick just because that ties into this conversation. Were you surprised that this was a setup for a series? No, because I think most authors in Warhammer 40k hope for some sort of series, at least a sequel with their stuff. Unless it's something like the Space Marine Battles or, say, Space Marine Conquest series. They're supposed to be the one and done stories. I think stuff mm -hmm. like this, they hope to at least have a sequel, if not a trilogy. I was really surprised. I guess... I guess what surprised me is that Sliskis gets away in the end. That actually surprised me. Because so, I kind that, of expected... I mean... I expected this big... Yeah, I did not expect him to get away. Um, I think it might have been Josh Reynolds' intent to have a sequel either with Sliskis and or Lucas with mm -hmm. something. Um, I think it kind of has to be Sliskis, right? Because, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but he has Lucas's heart, which they made a big deal about. He says, right. I will not forget Lucas. And he's still out there. Like, there. But you know. Is a very but, large spider on my wall. But you. Oh, I'm sorry. But you know, with these books, with the way Black Librarian Games Workshop works. Um, you know, it's almost like comics in a way. A new author is going to come in, maybe pick up the pieces yes. and then just act like this didn't happen or it's, or it's not that important to continue. They might mention that, yes, Lucas well, doesn't have, he has a stasis bomb for a second heart. Sure. <laughs> we talk, can we talk about that for a second? Um, okay. That scene cracked me up. Especially when that scene cracked me. Yeah, they're yelling at Dimer for it, and he's like, "Well, he did make a very good case." <laughs> yeah, and he's like, "I did, I did make a very good case," <laughs> and I liked when he's like, "You have no idea what's gonna happen when it explodes." Nope. Like, yeah, and I actually so I had a feeling it was gonna be Chekhov's stasis gun <laughs> um, or stasis oh, bomb. <laughs> Um, I had a feeling because they mentioned it, like they spent a lot of time talking about it. So I was like, well, there's no way that this doesn't come back later. Um, well, I figured it would, but so, with like a it, Dark Angels thing. Not we're going to implant it in his chest thing. Right. Well, I actually kind of expected that he was going to like pull it out or something. And you guys, the spider is really damaging my calm. Um, so I figured that it was Do you need, to, like, do you need to, like, you need to phone in a friend? <laughs> I for... might need to phone in a friend. No, no, because the last time I asked my husband to kill one, he refused. And he was kind of like, uh, and then it got loose. This could be the same little bastard for all I know. Anyways. Um, so... Sorry, I'm trying to be professional. It's very hard. It's very big. Um, we're talking about like, like half dollar size here. Um, okay, so it's not like hand size big. Live in South America. Oh no! Nothing in the South. We have wolf spiders that size. Uh, we do too. If you live out more on the Eastern Plains, uh, one of our friends gets them in their window wells a lot, and they will be like, "Oh, Aragog, put Aragog paid us a visit today." Anyways, that's just not um, okay. It's not okay, and this little bastard's not okay. Anyways. Um, what would Lucas do? I think we'll um, all forgive you if you have to take a moment to throw a book at the wall. What if I miss? Oh. Well, then you better have more books. It's, it's it's actually on my soundproofing, my crate, egg crate stuff. So I don't even know if I could get a solid hit in. Anyways, somebody get me a bolt rifle. Because um, so <laughs> that's not overkill. <laughs> no, that would be burning down the house. Um, okay, but, fair. Or attacking it with the... Or attacking it with the stasis bomb, which I totally would do right now. Somebody get Lucas in here. It's damaging my calm. Anyways. Are we naming the spider so, Lucas? Is it being a trickster? It kind of is. Like, it is literally just sitting there hanging out. Like, hey, you gonna do something? So. Um, now everybody can see my lovely microphone. Uh, but the stasis bomb really cracked me up, by the way. I... Don't know why I I was not expecting that. That was a really oh well, no. good gag. No, I was not expecting that either. 
Because like even when they're all yelling at each other and he's like, he gave me a very good argument. He's like, yes, I did. Like I had no idea what they were talking about. And he's like, about, but a stasis bomb in his chest. I'm like, oh my God, Lucas. <laughs> oh, on the I, other hand though, I mean, it's just- I want to hear this- type of Lucas thing. I want to hear this argument right? that was really <laughs> convincing. I would have loved to hear heard it as well. I think that would have been absolutely amazing. Okay, we're going to turn off my camera for a second. So keep talking about your opinions on- um, Oh, she's got a book with so, red pages. I will be using one of the horror novels to- Hey, it this fits. Um, oh, you should really grab a Stephen King book because he likes spiders, spider demons and stuff, so. That's true. Um, but yes, so let us continue to speak on many things about, so you're absolutely right. Somebody else could pick up this thing with a stasis bomb in his chest if they lose, if they lose that little bit of flavor about him, I will be sorely disappointed. They don't have to bring back Sliskis, but if they lose right. that, I will be very disappointed. But, you know, the universe is so wide. This takes place in the past because it takes place in 641 M41. So Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. To say what okay, so in the next few I have years. to say, authors in the future, please put dates on these because I love it when there's dates on them. Because I love yes, to see very much so. when this takes place. Like, it, like... Because, you know, Ravener and Eisenhorn didn't have dates, and it wasn't until I got to read the Magos that they showed the dates. I'm like, oh, now I see where this is. Because I knew it was somewhat in, like, the past, but I didn't know how far. But, you know, having these dates in here and knowing that this is, man, several hundred years before the Great Rift, I guess you could say, the present day. Um, and we know Lucas is still alive. Because he was in Ashes of Prospero, and that is post Rift. Yes, it is post Rift. Yes. yes, it is. They did not mention his stasis bomb in his heart. They Although, did Gav not mention his stasis bomb <clears throat> in his heart. Okay, for our podcast people, she got the spider, okay? <laughs> you guys, I had to mute my mic because I went to hit it and it jumped down to the chest. <laughs> And there was a scream. Anyways. I'm glad you muted your mic because that might have scared me because your mic, your camera was off. So that would have probably scared the crap out of me. Anyway. You'd be like, oh no, it's not her. So like, at least we know that Lucas, in a way, is part of the series going forward. Even though, um, okay, yes. What he did with Magnus was the dumbest thing imaginable. And Gav Thorpe should feel bad for it. Sorry, Gav. Like, I love Your idea is bad, and you should feel bad. I'm sorry, Mr. Thor. I loved that book until that moment. Okay. Yeah, anyway, carrying on. But I hope that something in the future gets referenced. Because, I mean, I know that with the Rift, there was a lot going on with the Space Wolves. And again, like, I haven't finished reading, you know, David Annandale's and uh, Robbie McNiven's stuff regarding the wolves right after the rift when the Magnus kind of drew his little sigil above their planet and the dark mm -hmm. angels came in and was like, what's, what's this wolf in business that we should get involved in? You guys got your own problems, okay? Worry about yourselves. Let's leave Seriously, a little... clean up your own house before yeah. you go cleaning up other people's houses. Yeah, leave the dogs alone, all right? Fix, you. mm -hmm. Fix yourselves first. But there's like Fix so your shit. But there's like so much. And like I would love a book in the future. Robbie Robbie Bobby goes and talks to Ragnar Blackmane. And they get an accord. You know, and he's just like, Yeah, you guys didn't follow my codex. I really don't fucking care. Just please like still be, you know, loyal dogs of the Empire. Which I know Very that much. they would. I know they would. Even though it is to, you know, Ultramar. I think even right. the, even think even the Space Wolves understand the Ultramarine's purpose and all of it. I, I would, at least, I would agree with that. At least Lehman all. Russ. Lehman Russ would have understood. Yes. Lehman Russ would have understood. And Lehman Russ 
so yes i think lehman russ would understand and i think that they would very easily pick up that because i think i think robbie bobby above all of the other brothers understood the purpose of russ and his wolves oh, i yes. think he i don't necessarily think he approved of it but he understood and i also think at this point with everything else that's going on in the universe if they were like yeah so the wolfen thing's getting a little more unstable he would just be like great can you fight like, right i think at this point it would be so low in his priority list right well but you know um, he, you know he knows about the gene flaw of course he has to know about it and he may not even care you know he really might not just you know it's like, would you he be really there? Not. Would you rise up in the final fight? I can't imagine the wolves being like, you know, no. We're really going to sit back on this one. <laughs> right. Well, actually, the funny thing is, is if he comes up and he's like, will you be on my side in the final fight? A, yes, of course they will. But they'll also be like, but it's not the final fight. Because our father isn't back yet. Right. He well, will absolutely be back for it. I know it's not the final fight because I know that whatever... Because we haven't seen the big enemy's final form yet. So I know we're not there no. yet. No, this isn't even Abaddon's final form. No, we're probably like and at phase two or three at most. I think we might even just be at phase one, honestly. Um, I mean, if you think about it, we have one Primarch back... Uh, Kadia just got destroyed. I mean, as the crow flies. Um, but I'm, I'm talking about just villains in one. general because we have Abaddon. Now we're getting the Silent King is waking up. Oh, uh, good point. Actually, so yeah. I think so we're we in, might phase, in phase two. phase three, phase two or three of villains here. So, well, right. We'll Very see. much so. Well, phase one was just the demons in general. All right, phase two is the Idea. rift abaddon and the rift that would be a good name for a band <laughs> abaddon and actually. the rift <laughs> phase three is the silent king right actually i was wondering is phase one the rift because that's you know demons pop up because the rift gets ripped open katia falls but then, blah, 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 but, blah, but, blah. then but then what was the is big bad before the rift that's what i'm saying that was phase one was pre-rift well, the big bad pre-rift was always just kind of generic chaos. Well, okay, so that's, you know, that's like Frieza's original form. Like, we didn't even get to see his final form until right before he was killed. So, you know. That's true. But the Tyranids might fit in there somewhere, too. But anyways. Dragon Ball Z so, references for the win. I picked up on it. Um, <laughs> I understood that reference. I have a feeling that Robbie Drag G, Robbie Bobby's level is over 9,000. Oh, easily. The hair goes up, too. I really need to the, stop drinking like wine, but... Pizza. So, let's talk about another... Speaking of phased approaches, because these people seem to be the master of phased approaches, let's wildly speculate about Harlequins. So, we okay, know... Fuck these people. That's all I have to say about them. No. Okay, you no. guys, no. I used to hate the Harlequin. I'm sorry, I used to hate the Harlequins. They're my favorite thing from Josh Reynolds now. I would love to have a short story collection from Josh Reynolds that were just about the Harlequins popping up in various people's lives to wreak havoc in their own ends. I have no use but for space dancing clowns. <laughs> oh god, I actually loved them. I actually adored them in this book. I thought they were so much fun in the way that they would just pop up and the way she would kind of sass. But we only got to see the she. We only got to see the shadow seer this time. We didn't really get to see the rest of the troop. The rest of the troop was mentioned flitting about, but you really didn't get to see them that much. Well, we have and, no idea what what story they were telling. So in Fabius Bile, we learn that their whole story they're telling and the whole purpose that they're there is to basically lead him down this path of ineptitude, I guess. But like, look, you're going to try to recreate the Legion. It's a fool's errand. You'll stop doing whatever it is you're doing. Made sense. 
totally loved it. Meanwhile, over here, it's very... It's, at first, I was like, what was the point of the Harlequins? Until he took Lucas's heart. And then I was like, oh, oh shit, he did what the Harlequins told him to do. Which was funny, because Sliska's hated the Harlequins. And he totally did what the Harlequins said he was going to do. And Lucas proclaimed to hate Grimblood. And Grimblood was totally right. So, the mirror balancing of the scales there. Um, what's the end game here? Like, what? What do the Harlequins have, have one? Or are they just playing whatever? Oh. I don't oh, know if yes. they do. If they're just playing some random tale that they feel like playing today. So, in many ways, I think the Harlequins are actually another perfect foil for Lucas because they also seem to be very much into throwing a wrench into other people's plans just to do it. We just well, want to take Fabia's bile off the playing board. We just want to do this. We just want to do that. There might be a big end game that they're working toward, or they might just be their own type of trickster. Trickster clown. Ooh. Their own little fool's jesters? Pretty much. I mean... Who's to say? I mean, because they were talking about Fabius file that they were pushing him towards this one thing. And he's like, well, what did you see that made you want to push, you know, towards? So it's like, obviously, they're having, you know, maybe there's some future that they're pushing towards, which I'm assuming has something to do with, you know, helping the Eldar race survive. That's just what I'm assuming. I would have to assume, but who knows? Who absolutely knows? But they what also their could just is. be like, we're just fucking with everybody. It really could be. And I cannot, for the life of me, maybe they figure put... out what they would need with one heart. I mean, they could have done this with Fabius knowing that he'd be asking them, well, what did you see? Well, then I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Because they even said, up oh, and your play is done. Maybe he did what, he, what they wanted him to do. We don't know. We don't know. And in this, though, oh, what if they saw that he was going to put the stasis bomb in his chest? And what if that's going to be important at some point? What if this is also, on one hand, I'm torn because I, I think I've mentioned before, one of the tropes that I really don't like are, are uh, Xanatos gambits. Unless your name is David Xanatos, in which case. But otherwise, I'm you not a big the fan founder of, them. of the gambit, but go on. You might say that, yes. Um, well, it's because of the time it. They did it so well. But um, that show was flawless. Um, what if this is all a giant? I actually kind of like it with the Harlequins because it makes it kind of funny. Because, again, nobody likes these people. And they are space theater kids. And I'm sorry. I'm a little partial to it. Well, I'm just saying. You know, they're not unlike the bard troops of Orlay. Dance in and assassinate no. everybody okay. and dance out. Yeah, fuck those people. I I do not like the bar. Oh, mm. okay. They're now you're giving different. me a crisis of faith because. It's... Okay, yes, they are because the Harlequins are at least funny. The, the bar Elysians... takes themselves entirely too serious. Elysians find themselves very funny. That's why they wear the masks. That's true. <laughs> the. The Eldar don't have time for masks. Like, why would you even bother with that shit? I'll just tell you that I'm going to kill you. Because <laughs> now it's up to you to not let me. <laughs> I love I love how casual their attitude is to all of that. But, so that's one thing that I hope does get carried along as well, is this Harlequin idea that the Harlequins are, and I don't know if this is just Josh Reynolds, or if we're going to start to see this in more stories as well the idea that the harlequins are moving and the harlequins are making plays and they have i don't want to say that they have a plan well but they have eight percent of a plan here's the problem though everything that josh reynolds has written about the harlequins has been a few hundred years in the past a few hundred few thousand years in the past So, okay. That's a good point. 
And he might have been the only person who really liked them. I mean, I could be totally wrong. Somebody somebody else could pick up the Harlequins and be like, you know, I like what he was doing there. And I'm going to pick up the Harlequins. And I'm going to do something else like more like in modern times. Or the Harlequins ran their their plans or whatever until until the rift. And that's why we're not hearing from them right now with all this. That could be. Honestly, that could be that with the rift, they were like, oh, shit. <laughs> they had to go back to the Black Library to figure out some more of their plays and then come back. They were like, look, guys, Rent is dead. We got to go and get, like, cats or something. It's not 1998 anymore. We need to get something else. Exactly. <laughs> like, we need something a little fresher. We need to get that, uh, we need to get that Hamilton that everyone's talking about. <laughs> Maybe some Avenue Q in there. I don't know. Right. I absolutely do feel like the Harlequins, instead of bemoaning, what do you do with a BA in English? I actually think that they would be bemoaning, what do you do when you have the whole wealth of human and and alien knowledge in one place? (laughs) What do you do with the Black Library? Um, Keep it away from Armin. Um, (laughs) Yeah, but uh, the song of what you do with a BA in English, I mean, that hit really close to home. I don't think what would you do with the Black Library would hit as close to home. (laughs) Oh, I don't know, because it depends on the audience. I can sitting... imagine just all the thousand, I mean, all the thousand sons to just be sitting there going, it's not cool. As I'm sitting there in the audience going. Yeah, when I first heard that song, I just sat there and was like, oh, it's not funny. It's My husband true, thought man. it was hilarious. My husband thought it was hilarious. I bet he did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyways, um, so I, I'm really, I did not enjoy this book, but I am bummed that we won't get to see any more of Sliskis. I'm bummed that we won't get to you know, see what the so Harlequins were doing. I have to Lucas's say, heart. I'm seeing a lot here with like Spear of the Emperor and that, you know, you love that one. I didn't like it so much, but the more we talked about it, the more... I even found like, okay, yes, I really did like this. And yes, I am curious where it's going. And actually, the more I've thought about it, the more like, okay, I actually would read a sequel. Damn it. And I'm kind of seeing that here with Lucas the Trickster. I really liked it. You did. But the more we talk about it, you're like, oh, no, that was a really good point. And no, that was really good. I would like to see more of this. And you know, if there was a sequel with him and Sliskus and this heart, you'd be, you'd be on board. Totally read it. So I... It's so yeah, so this is our like about. yeah reverse spear of the emperor thing, I guess. It is actually, and this is something that you and I have talked about a lot with the Black Library is that we've been very fortunate. I don't think either of us have read a book yet where we just hated it, and we saw no value. Hated in it. it. And I think it's because <laughs> hated it. Yeah, we Thank haven't done that yet. On that. <laughs> no, we haven't had anything like that yet, and I think it's because like even though I didn't really like this book, Josh Reynolds is still a very talented author. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you can always find something in here to enjoy. And I think it's because the world is so vast and it has such a storied, rich history and these rich concepts. And so, like, even though I didn't really like Lucas as a character, I could still latch on to the villain. Right. And even though you didn't like Spear of the Emperor, there were still little pieces here and there that you could latch on to and be like, well, this is actually pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And. I guess, and this is one of the things that I've always said about Warhammer 40k that I really like about it, is that there's something for everyone. It's true. But, yeah, this is not one that I'll be, it won't be very high on my uh, awards at the end of this year. (laughs) Well, I mean, probably not mine either, but I'm so glad that I read it. I really am. Oh, yes. I am as well. So, but I have have to say. I have another Space Wolf I like, so, yay! Yay! I have to say that I'm really, really excited that for our next book, we're going back to the Inquisition. Which Can you believe we're saying guys, that? Especially me, who, like, again, at the beginning oh, of the last book oh, in the series. What do I have? Ooh. See, and look at the pages. Look at the nice emblem on the pages. It's so pretty. Oh, and look, two bookmarks. Yeah, it's so pretty. See, now open it up. 
Oh, and look, John French signed it personally. You can't see it, but it says to my friend Carrie right up there. It does. Look, um, look at that. If the random imperial, if the random imperial citizen will please let my co-host know that I'm no longer speaking to her. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the spider that I just killed. Maybe it can tell you. Um, but Man, that's I like two Vegas podcasts in a row. And you said that we're not speaking. We're not speaking anymore. So <laughs> I hear a voice as if from the past. Um, I'm really excited to get back into this series. Uh, I really, am too. Cover art, Guys, cover cover art is just art, gorgeous. It'd be great it if has, that uh, sister of Repentia wasn't on it, but you know, beggars can't be choosers. I actually look how I love how really she is just over it, and she is not in the mood for your bullshit. On the artwork, like you can really see, man, she is having none of whatever you're selling. I uh. Oh no, she is definitely I'm... pissed off. Oh yeah. Whatever you, whatever bullshit you're trying to hawk about saving the emperor and the imperium. She's having none of it. But, that, but then again, so I like, uh, then again, you know, last book, they had both of his male compatriots. So now he has to have like the rest of them on this book. Totally understand that. Well, and I think I think the third book, which we'll eventually get to, um, I think it has the other people on there. So they're doing a really good job of cycling through. Well, it has. Um, so we're going to be reading. No, it has the Rogue Trader. But that's the that's the dude, the brother, isn't it? Because this is Viola. This is Viola. That's the brother. No, this is Viola. Look at her, the white Viola? hair. Look at the white hair. Oh, you're right. No, no you're totally right. But it also this, has the psyker. But this is the psyker right there. Yeah, it is the psyker. And I mean, of course, that's oh, wait. Know, Covenant. Right. Anyways, really excited to read this one. And I hope that you guys will join us on our inquisition with me being really happy that if inquisitors die journey except for covenant i think we like covenant he seems cool i do actually kind of like covenant for now he seems okay for an inquisitor him and erasmus call okay we're crowl call too many people have (laughs) too many similar names i swear to god they really do they need to diversify so, because there's also the uh, the uh, the navigator house cr- cow call, which is not to be mistaken with Belisarius call. No, it's not call. Which is not to I be think it's, mistaken. No, it's house. No, it's house Belisarius. It's house Belisarius. Yes. So there's house Belisarius, which is not to be mistaken with Belisarius call, who is not to be mistaken with Inquisitor Crowl. Yeah. Do you get? Do you guys got all that straight? So it's kind of, in Good. many ways, all these names kind of remind me of when the first watched uh, Boardwalk Empire. Because, like, the first half of oh, the season, yes. I was like, I can't keep up. And and I think I was talking to you because you'd already seen it. And you're like, why? I was like, because there's a lot of white people dressed the same who all have the same hair. So, I mean, I can't keep up yes. with who is who. A lot of dudes with the razor undercut. And you're just like, huh? All pale-faced, and, uh, blonde oh. hair wearing three-piece suits the only person you can pick out is steve buscemi because please it's steve buscemi he's amazing he's distinct in that show. if you haven't ever watched if you haven't ever watched oh my boardwalk God. empire i highly recommend it you can get to the part where uh it, i think it's season three actually the end of season three where everybody that i know including carrie texted me to say are you okay <laughs> <laughs> so anyways and the answer was Mm-hmm. never okay you want to take us out carrie i sure will so thank you so much for listening to the warhammer 40k book club ep- episode regarding lucas the trickster by josh reynolds be sure to join us for our next book incarnation by john french we are now un- you're just flaunting i am flaunting oh look at this there's a quote on the back look how pretty this get is. out it says fucking finish salvation is a dream that has lost its way that's deep do you have that on your book anyway <laughs> finish this shit we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the black library or any of its affiliates you can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website wh40kbookclub.com if you like this episode please like subscribe give a review and all those things to the vidcast on youtube or the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. 
Don't forget, we also have a Patreon where we offer two different tiers of content for your viewing and listening pleasure. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash wh40kbookclub.com. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and listen to Form a Crag. Listen. Oh, okay. No more wine listen. for me. You didn't listen to. You yeah, do listen, you. listen and read from a crag. Okay, I need to stop drinking. No, I don't. No, I don't. Anyway, good night, everybody.